Today's video is brought to you by Card Kingdom, and you can pre-order all the Double Masters cards you need now over at CardKingdom.com. Hello everyone, it's Seth, probably better known as Saffron Olive, and it's time for another daily dose of Double Master Spoilers, and we got a ton to talk about today, so we better jump right into it, start talking about new cards, and then of course at the end we'll talk some uh, finance -y stuff. I might have a little mini rant <laughs> about Double Master's finance, but anyway, let's talk new Double Master's cards, starting with our land cycle, so we finally got the land cycle from Double Masters. It's not fetch lands. We already knew that. They said they wouldn't be in the set. We do have the Allied Filter Lads, which, good news and bad news with the Allied Filter Lads. So, good news is, the cycle is pretty expensive. A lot of them were in the $20 to $30 price range. Discounting Graven Karens, which had an extra reprinting. The bad news is, most of these cards were expensive because they'd never really been reprinted. They were super old. They had one like masterpiece reprinting which doesn't really count as a reprinting so they were essentially one print cards so their price tag was more because they're pretty rare they're really old from a not that heavily open set so their price is already dropping a ton which is a good thing if you need them however i don't really know if you need them i was looking and trying to figure out where you play these and a minority of commander decks do play them although they rank behind a lot of other lands in commander like uh, shock lands and fetch lands and the buddy lands and the fast lands there's a huge list of dual lands that actually see more play than the filter lands at this point so yeah maybe you'll play them in some commander decks they used to see fridge play in modern that doesn't really happen anymore they get wrecked by damping sphere we just have more better lands available now than we did like five or ten years ago so the price is going to come down i'm glad that the price is going to come down do you need more filter lands I mean, maybe they'll become like a budget option for commander players. Maybe being cheaper will increase their play. So overall, a decent reprinting. Although, just keep in mind, the reason the cards were expensive is mostly because they never been reprinted before, rather than because you need them for your decks, because there's so many good dual lands available today. Speaking of lads, we do have one legitimately sweet lad reprint, which is Academy Ruins. So Academy Ruins, it's a card that was 30-ish dollars. Uh, it had been reprinted once in a master set, coming along with a box topper, of course, which looks super sweet with John Avon, I guess Atlantis, under the water type art. So anyway, uh, Academy Ruins, this is a card that not only is it expensive, like the filter lads, but this is one that actually sees play and has demand. Academy Ruins, in modern, it mostly sees play in blue. Neutron, which is not a tip-top tier deck, but it is an actual deck because it enables some Mind Slaver lock where every turn you get up to a ton of mana with your Tron lands and then you just like Mind Slaver your opponent, steal their turn, Academy Ruins, get back Mind Slaver, do it again. Essentially, not only taking infinite turns, but you get infinite turns and you get to control your opponent during each of their turns, which is even more devastating than an infinite turn style lock. It also sees a lot of playing commander. Essentially, any blue-based artifact deck is going to play Academy Ruins. Uh, it is just free free value if you have a bunch of artifacts it comes into play untapped yes it taps for colorless but if you're an artifact deck you can afford more colorless lands because presumably a decent number of your cards are colorless anyway so academy ruins really solid reprint from a value perspective from a playability perspective gonna get cheaper for your commander decks if you want to build blue tron and modern gonna help there as well we also got sword number two sword of fire and ice and this is actually a really big reprint so sword of fire and ice currently like 75 to 80 dollars depending on the version and it comes with a mythic box topper and it has super sweet art i really really love the box topper art so cool so sword of fire dice is probably the second best sword in magic and as far as prices go i believe it's the most valuable we talked about this a little bit when sword of war and peace was revealed or kind of like man sword of war and peace itself isn't exciting but if it means sword of fire and ice and some of the better swords are coming back that is good news so it does see a bit of commander play and equipment based decks but this is a sword that actually sees tournament play in modern and in legacy and stoneforge mystic decks which is probably going to make the box topper pretty popular although uh, there 
is like a masterpiece version, so there's competition for the most like blinged out version of Sword and Fire Dice. But still, it's an $80-ish, $75-ish mythic that you're going to want for some commander decks. You're going to want for some modern and legacy decks. This should bring down the price and give players a sweet and just amazingly arted piece of bling to, uh, to use in their deck. So, super hyped for this reprint. This is an actual good sword, and as far as just reprint value, the best sword that Wizards could put into Double Masters. Next on our list, we have the return of Box Opal at Mythic, of course, along with more sweet Box Topper art. Regardless of what you think about how Box Toppers have been handled, which we'll talk about that in the future, uh, they do have some really amazing art. So Box Opal, you're probably thinking, wait, didn't that just get banned? And it did just get banned in Modern not that long ago. However, pre-banning Box Opal is like $100. Even being banned in Modern, it is still over $50, like somewhere around $55. So it is still a really expensive card and still a desirable open because it sees a lot of play in Legacy, in Vintage, in Commander, as far as the non-Commander formats. It's a staple of Paradoxical Outcome decks in the Vintage format, plus in Vintage, you got all the Moxin and stuff, so it's super easy to turn on Mox Opal. Uh, in Legacy, shows up in Tendrils of Agony style Storm decks, which also have Artifact Mana, Lotus Petals, and so forth to turn it on. So it sees a lot of play there. And in Commander, it shows up in mostly Artifact decks and also CEDH decks. So if you're playing like Urza, for example, Joyra, which cares about historic spells, Alea cares about artifact spells, or if you're playing CEDH, where you are often playing a ton of Mana Rocks, all the Mana Vaults and Mana Crypts and Soul Rags, all of that stuff, the fastest Mana Rocks, Mox Opal turns itself on really quickly in a deck like that, so it gets better the more efficient and competitive and fast mana-based your deck happens to be. So as a result, even though Box Opal is no longer legal in Modern, still a really expensive card, still a card that people need in their collections, and therefore a solid Mythic reprint, one of the more valuable Mythic reprints we've had in the last couple of days, coming soon to Double Masters. Speaking of Mythic reprints, we got a couple of my all-time favorite artifacts returning at Mythic and Double Masters, Ensnaring Bridge and also Trinisphere. So these are prison pieces, and Snaring Bridge can lock creatures out of attacking forever if you can get your uh, self empty-handed, or at least low on cards. Trinisphere can just lock players out of playing Magic altogether by making every spell at least cost three mana. So if your opponent's playing cheap stuff, it's always going to be three mana, or if you can keep your opponent below three mana, they just can't cast anything at all. So these cards, they're not like super duper expensive, although in Snaring Bridge, $26, worth way more than the price of a pack. Uh, Trinisphere, $30, way more than the price of a pack. So maybe not like Jason Mind Sculptor or Mana Crypt, but still really expensive cards that you're going to be happy to open in a pack. As far as playability, these are mostly modern slash legacy cards. Uh, Ensnaring Bridge, you've probably seen this play a million times. It is part of the holy trinity of mono red prison pieces. When you're looking to lock your opponent out of the game, the big ones are Blood Moon for the mana, Chalice of the Void for cheap spells, and then Ensnaring Bridge for creatures. That is the core of Mono Red Prison free win red style decks across formats, and actually, hopefully we get a Blood Moon at some point. I would love for this deck to get cheaper, because it's really powerful. I find it really fun. Opponents, on the other hand, probably don't find it quite as fun. But these pieces, getting reprinted, hopefully brings the price down a little bit. So, who knows? Maybe someday we'll be able to play budget free win red. That would be a super sweet budget magic episode. As far as Tritosphere, Tritosphere's a little bit different. Trinisphere really likes to be played alongside land destruction rather than land disruption like Blood Moon because Trinisphere, the best thing you can do with it is get it on the battlefield quickly keep blowing up your opponent's lands so they stay at like one to two lands and that just means your opponent can't cast spells your opponent can't do anything because trinosphere if you never played against it it makes everything cost three mana and there are really no exceptions there's no getting around it you gotta pay three mana no matter what so if you keep your opponent down to two lands they just can't cast spells so something like turn one mana dork turn two trinosphere turn three blow up your land turn four blow up your land you could potentially just hard lock your opponent out of playing magic altogether so like ponza style decks can take it advantage of it. Also, we've played Mono Green Land Destruction, which is an absolute blast. Plow Wonders, Acid Bosses, Primal Commands, just keep making your opponent put the lands on top of their deck, locking them with Trinisphere. So, I am super hyped for these reprints, because these are cards that I just really love to play. We've played a ton of Ensnaring Bridge, a lot of Trinisphere as well. Hopefully, this will get the price down to a more reasonable range, and more people can experience the joy of making your opponent 
<laughs> not be able to play magic. Next on our list, we have a couple of red commander sweepers. Rolling Earthquake, one of the best earthquake effects that you have hitting everything except creatures with horsemanship so most of the time that's just hitting everything and your opponents and yourself I guess for a bunch of damage. Blasphemous Act just an ultra staple. I think of Blasphemous Act almost as the red version of Cyclonic Rift. I know their effects are not really the same but that's the kind of staple that Blasphemous Act is. Similar to how if you're playing a blue deck in Commander you're probably going to have Cyclonic Rift. If you're playing a red deck in Commander you're probably going to have Blasphemous Act it's off to just a one mana hard sweeper with some additional synergies thrown in, but really, just any red deck can play it as a wrath, because basically every commander deck should have some number of wraths, and Blasphemous Act is the best one going in the commander format for your red deck. So, as far as actual playability, as I mentioned, Blasphemous Act is just an ultra staple, and I want to point out, these cards are not super expensive. Blasphemous Act, I think, was $6. Rolling Earthquake, also in that same price range, but Blasphemous Act is $6, despite the fact that it is reprinted essentially every year to Commander deck. I think it was 2014, 2015, 2016, 2018 on top of the original Innistrad printing. So we've had it reprinted five times in the last like six years or something. And it's still six or seven dollars. This is a card that, if it wasn't reprinted as often, would probably be twenty dollars, thirty dollars. So even though it might not seem exciting, this is kind of the other side of the reprint coin. It's sometimes you're like, oh, it's a disappointing reprint. It's only six dollars, only seven dollars. But really, that reprinting is helping make sure a card like Blasphemous Act that you are going to need for basically every Red Commander deck not increase to twenty dollars. So it's still a really good reprint because it's kind of holding off future price increases because there's a ridiculous amount of demand for this card. As far as Rolling Earthquake, it actually doesn't see that much play. It used to be super expensive because it was a Portal 3 Kingdoms card. Got reprinted once, went from like $200 to $5. It does see like the fridgiest of play. Oddly, it actually sees less play than Earthquake, even though Rolling Earthquake is essentially a harder version of that effect because there's less creatures with flying than there are creatures with horsemanship. And when Rolling Earthquake does see play, it's mostly in some sort of like synergistic deck. Like a Neheb just wants you to deal mass damage to everything so you can turn that into mana. Fire Saga and Sunspeaker want you to deal mass damage with instants of sorceries with lifelink so you gain a bunch of life. Uh, or even horsemanship style decks is other play, then you turn it into the one-sided wrath kind of your red plague win. Uh, but really, Rolling Earthquake, unlike Blasphemous Act, doesn't just show up in any red commander deck. It mostly shows up in specific decks that somehow synergize around the mass damage effect. Blasphemous Act, as I said, it's just an ultra stable. So two reasonable reprints with Blasphemous Act definitely being the most exciting of the two because it should bring the price down a little bit. In worst case, it'll keep that price from increasing because like I said, ridiculous amount of demand for Blasphemous Act thanks to commander. We also got the return of Court of Calling. So Court of Calling, we have two versions here, although not a box topper version. I don't believe it's been confirmed what the second version is. It's some sort of promo. I assume that it's another like buy a box. Uh, I assume that it's another like pre-release style promo, uh, but we'll have to wait to get actual confirmation. Court of Calling, nice mid-range reprint, both for Commander and Modern. As far as Commander, shows up in any sort of creature deck. The ability to play a bunch of creatures and essentially tutor out another creature for free thanks to the convoke mechanic really powerful if you're like going wide with elves in azuri or marwin playing some sort of yissin creature tutor deck chew lane likes a bunch of creatures so if you're playing a green deck with a lot of creatures and mana dorks and so forth to pay the convoke cost court of calling is really good also does the same thing essentially in modern where it's primarily played to set up creature based combos index with a bunch of like random one drops uh, the best example right now as far as top tier decks is the vizier of everybody's devoted druid infinite mana combo. And those decks, Court of Calling, great way to snipe whatever combo piece you happen to be missing. If you got your combo, you're going to win anyway. You could use Court of Calling to get like your finisher. So really good at setting up creature-based combos. Not super expensive because it was reprinted in a core set. It used to be super expensive when it was only the Ravnica reprinting. But it showed up in a core set not that long ago to keep the price down. But still, a solid, like decent mid-range reprinting. And really cool art on the promo as well. Next on our list, we have Phyrexian Metamorph, along with rare box topper Phyrexian Metamorph, which 
actually has some pretty sweet art. So Phyrexia Metamorph, one of the better clones in Magic, uh, technically four mana, but one of its Phyrexian, so it could come down for three mana, which is cheaper than most clones, and it has the extra upside of hitting artifacts along with creatures. So not only cheaper, if you're willing to pay a bit of life than most clones, but more flexible than a lot of clones as well, which is why it sees play. So Phyrexia Metamorph, mostly a commander card at this point. I don't think it sees play uh, in any top tier non-commander decks, but it shows up in a couple of places. One is artifact themed decks. It can take advantage of Phyrexian Metamorph's ability to copy powerful non-creature artifacts. Uh, Shrew, Mishra, decks like that. The other place it shows up is in clone themed decks. Shakashima, Garuda, all about copying uh, the commander, copying other stuff a bunch of times. Phyrexian Metamorph lines up perfectly with decks like that as well. On the other end, Phyrexian Metamorph just showed up in uh, Mystery Booster, so it's only like a $5 card. It was more than that, so it's trending in the right direction. So, not high value, and we'll see about the box topper. I don't expect it to be super high value there as well, but... Definitely not a bad card to have more supply out of the market of. Otherwise, we got a bunch of, I would say, mid-range artifact-themed rares today. Master Transmuter used to be like 10 bucks, down to 4 bucks thanks to Mystery Boosters, and now it's probably going to be like bulk rare, which I think is a good thing. That's a card that you will actually play in some Commander decks, being able to kind of sneak attack an artifact from your hand into play. Pretty powerful out of 4-drop. Could also Forge Magic, another way to cheat artifacts into play, especially when you have a with like lightning greaves or something can be really powerful again worth a couple of bucks duplicate might actually be the most playable card of the bunch really good removal spell especially for artifact decks in commander big mana decks however it's been reprinted a lot of times so it's not actually expensive or in dire need of a reprinting but it is a card that if you open in a booster yeah you're not going to be excited value wise but at least you're going to stick it in a commander deck and be pretty happy with it we also got a bunch of lower rarity stuff, most of it not super interesting. The big one, as far as lower rarity stuff, Mishra's Bobble, which has been all over the place price-wise. Uh, the Loris Age shot way up in price. It used to be like $50 during the Death Shadow era before it was reprinted in Iconic Masters. Right now, it's still like five-ish dollars or something, but that's a good thing because it was absurdly expensive for an uncommon. So more reprints, gonna keep that price down, keep it in check, make sure it doesn't get out of hand again the next time the free spell has some top tier home to abuse it. As far as bulk rares, the two biggest ones today, Sundry Titan Beacon of Unrest. I guess technically Beacon of Unrest is a couple of bucks as a reanimation spell that can hit artifacts. As far as Sundry Titan, it's a really powerful card that I love playing in like cubes, but it's banned in Commander because you can kind of like hose one player's mana base potentially or hose everyone's mana base. So it is banned in Commander, which really limits the demand for it. Like doesn't really see play in Constructed formats can't see playing commander because it's banned so even though it's powerful it just doesn't cost very much because you can't really play it anywhere finally today checking it on prices kind of got two things to talk about today first off as far as just the average value of stuff both mythics and to a lesser extent rare so we'll get to uh, continue to drop mythics are down to $29.53 average after being as high as $49 on day one. Again, this is mostly because prices are dropping. Our new mythics, uh, Trinisphere, $30, Mox Opal, $55, and Snaring Bridge, $26. Uh, so most of the mythics that have been previewed are still valuable, but we're seeing like Mana Crypt down to $86. We see cards like Jace dropping down to $66. Uh, so we're seeing big price declines there. As far as rare, the Filter Lands and Academy Ruins gave it a bit of a bump in value. Right now we're at 586 for average value with a median lower at 390. But again, prices are just dropping, dropping, dropping for the lower tier rares and the higher tier rares as well. So that's the average value of both rares and mythics still looking pretty solid despite the price declines. However, we got to talk a little bit about box toppers. So uh, the story of box toppers from Double Masters. Originally, a Wizards announced that we are going to have these sweet box toppers. In fact, they were the first cards that we saw from Double Masters. And 
we've had a couple of issues with these cards so far. First off, when Wizards announced them and published the article about VIP boosters, they said that you would get two rares and mythics in your pack and then two rare or mythic box toppers. But then, once they started to preview the set, we started seeing crop rotations and trod lands and expedition maps, which are cards that are clearly not rares or mythics in the traditional sense. In fact, they're commons or uncommons, but Wizards slapped the rare symbol on them and made them into box toppers. So Wizards apologized for that, said, oh, we made a mistake, whatever. Okay, so uh, mistake, whatever, people do that sometimes. Then yesterday, one of the things we were puzzling over is, would box toppers all be the same rarity? Like, do you have an equal chance of getting a super expensive mana crypt as a random common, like crop rotation or Urza's Tower? And we got the answer yesterday. And the answer is no. There are two rarities in box toppers uh, with rares, which will show up twice as often as the mythics. So rare wise, while some of the cards are good, like Expiration is a beautiful and fairly val valuable box topper. There's also all these upgraded Cobbits and Uncobbits, which are just not all that expensive. Also some pretty, like, lackluster rares, Meddling Mages and Council's Judgment and so forth, which are just not that exciting. On the other hand, the good cards, the valuable cards, the $100 worth of box toppers, Jaces and Mana Crypts and Doubling Seasons and Traxes and Dark Confidants, all that stuff is going to be the Mythic box toppers, which are going to show up at half the frequency of the rare box toppers. So... This means a couple of things. First off, I'm mostly frustrated over the communication about it. Uh, Wizards just blatantly saying the wrong thing as far as you're getting all rares and mythics when you're kind of upgrading them. It, yes, technically, that's not untrue, but I think it set an expectation that the box stoppers would all be actual rares and mythics, not commons and uncommons that you slap the rare symbol on. Uh, so that was some lackluster, lackadaisical, whatever communication from Wizards. So that is frustrating. I also had the expectation that the box stoppers would be the same rarity as far as distribution was concerned, mostly because that's how Ultimate Masters worked. In Ultimate Masters, the bad box stoppers were the same rarity as the good box stoppers, so at least it was fair. Like, maybe you get a $300 Liliana, maybe you get a much less expensive eternal witness or something but they're all the same rarity so you have an equal shot with double masters things are weighted towards the less valuable less desirable box toppers and the good ones are going to be much harder to find buying normal boxes i don't think this is a huge deal i saw some people say i'm going to cancel my box because of this i don't think that's necessary because i think the ev of the box discounting box toppers is going to be high enough that it's still going to be a good value and the, and the box toppers are bonus. On the other hand, what I'm very skeptical of now is VIP boosters. Uh, if you are buying a VIP booster and you have a 1 in 40 shot of getting a $300 mana crypt or whatever. Uh, or actually, 2 in 40, because you get two box toppers in your VIP booster. Uh, so if you have a 20% chance of getting a $300 card and all these other Jaces and so forth, that seems like a pretty reasonable deal. On the other hand, if, as Wizards has said, they are skewing the rarity towards the lower rarity box toppers, crop rotations, explorations, Urza's Tower, your VIP booster that you're spending $100 on, the most most common outcome is going to be that you get two of the rares. I think it's more than 50% chance that you will get two rares. And remember, almost half of those rares are actually commons and uncommons with a rare symbol on them. Uh, so I'm much more skeptical of VIP boosters now. Initially, because I thought that the rarity would be distributed equally and your chance of getting a mana crypt would be the same as your chance of getting a crop rotation uh, that it would actually be a really good deal now I still think the EV will probably look fine however there's going to be a lot of variance and it's going to be hard for most players to open a single hundred dollar booster let alone enough hundred dollar boosters to equal out the variance and hit the ev it's going to be the ultimate gamble and you are going to open vip boosters that you spend a hundred dollars on and get two tron lands that are worth 25 dollars a piece or something maybe even less because they're going to be very common because they're showing up twice as much as the good box stoppers uh, and you're going to be really disappointed and lose half your money on the other hand seven percent of the time you're going to hit double mythics and you get a jason a mana crypt and you open a six hundred dollar booster and you're thrilled but uh, can you open 
$1,200 worth of boosters to finally hit that 7% chance to get the double mythic booster and have that great pack? Did you lose all your money opening Urza's Towers and crop rotations and rare, <laughs> which are really common box toppers? So that's been frustrating to me. Uh, Wizards, at least communicate it clearer and better. People had high expectations for this, and I feel like the expectations have definitely not been met in multiple ways with the two different rarities for box stoppers and the commons being upgraded to rares to, uh, I don't know, have less valuable box toppers and VIP boosters. But anyway, that's been our daily Double Master spoilers for today. So what do you think about the box topper thing? Uh, is that something that was worth being upset about? Uh, sh or were we all expecting it wrong? Should we have known that there was going to be two different rarities, that there was going to be common rares? Uh, let me know about that in the comments. What do you think about all the new cards today? Are you going to build a prison deck now with Tridosphere and Ensnaring Bridge? Maybe even Mox Opal if you're in Legacy. What about the rares? How good are the filter lands? Is that something that actually excites you? Do you need them? Will you pick them up now that they're cheaper? Or do we just have too many good land cycles now for them to be relevant, even in a format like Commander, Rolling Earthquake, Blasphemous Act, Court of Calling, all those cards as well? Let me know in the comments. Thanks so much for watching. I hope you all enjoyed it, and I will talk to you soon. Thanks for watching the video. If you enjoyed it, help us out by clicking that like button down below. And to keep up on all the latest and greatest, click that subscribe button. And don't forget to hit that bell icon to get alerts whenever we have new videos. And if you want to, check out some of our other sweet videos here and here.